Welcome to the On The Tape podcast. Guy Adami, always joined by Caitlin Malin, the COO of iConnections. But today we're going off the tape, Caitlin, with Peter Polanski, Senior Managing Director and Head of Structured Credit for Oprah Capital. How are you, Peter? I'm doing great. How are you? Good. So we start these things, and Caitlin's going to get into the granular stuff, but I always like to know sort of the backstory, like how you got to where you are, sort of the interesting things that got you to this point in life. Wow, that's a tough one. Um, <laughs> like from a career-wise, I started out life as an actuary, actually, and so I did that in the, we'll call it the 90s, right? And then um, in the early 2000s, I went to Morgan Stanley to be a strategist um, and structure credit and credit derivatives and all that fun stuff pre-crisis. Mm -hmm. And then in 2008, I joined Oxif as part of their kind of cap structure arm team. And uh, and then it was 2008, so it was just easier to buy stuff than try to do like four-legged complex trades. And so I ended up being responsible for anything that was structured in corporate, basically. So all the C, you know, CLOs, CBOs, all those kinds of products. And then in 2012, we launched the CLO Manager. I was involved in that. And I was running that business when I left two years ago to join Obra. And so now at Ober, I run um, my title is set of structure credit, but I'm responsible for our special suits business, our multi-sector credit investing business, and our leverage finance kind of um, platform. So, And tell us briefly about, just tell us about Obra Capital. Sure. O Obra is a, today it's a multi-line kind of specialty asset manager. Um, it, uh, you know, it started out life in 2009, right? Right after the financial crisis. Um, really, fo uh, as a monoline manager, focused on insurance products. So it invested in insurance assets, and so um, and so today we have um, we have what we call longevity, which is the insurance space. We have special sits, we have multi sector credit, we have uh, leverage finance, and we have asset based finance. And so all, the common thread among all those things is that um, they're kind of all require some specialty kind of underwriting, right? They require some. Um, some kind of you know some kind of specialization or some skill set that's not kind of you know typical for like you know if you want to look at corporate bonds you like analyze a company here it's going to be something different than that and so it's kind of like we try to take the the um, the level of sophistication that's present at the biggest asset managers but apply that to markets that are maybe too small for them to to be super focused on because they don't really move the needle for them so that's the, like kind of the common theme across the firm yeah no I think that makes that's great. Why don't we, before we get started and learn more about Obra, tell us a little bit about how you've seen the space evolve since you first got started. You've been in this for a while. Structured credit has changed. <laughs> um, I'm just curious to hear your perspective on that. Yeah, I remember, uh, you know, for, when I first, when I was first on the, on the on the desk, it was like these, they were, people were doing these transactions and, you know, there was absolutely no transparency, right? And so you couldn't see, like, unless you were sitting in the middle and seeing what was going on, um, you didn't really understand the whole thing. And today that's that's a very different animal. Like even CLOs, for example, you know, getting like what the portfolio managers did in the deal, right? You have to go like flip through the, the page and the document. Today there is, you know, a multitude of data providers that'll give you all that info. And so I think the difference is that um it's it's that the availability of like what's going on inside the deals is so much more visible uh, than it was back then. And and it was really kind of adult swim, right? You had to like go in and dig and find the stuff yourself. And it wouldn't necessarily be like kind of at your fingertips. And today, I think because of just you know technology, it's a lot it's a lot more transparent to the investor, which means kind of the people who are running the dealers or, or managing the structure or whatever, they're way more accountable, right, than they would have been you know, whatever twenty years ago. Right, and no, that makes sense. You, I saw as well. I think Obra is in a unique spot, and I'm curious about like the liquidity profile of what you're doing. And you launched the ETF platform, which is to me, feels a bit use distinct for structured credit to have an ETF product. So tell us more about that. Yeah, so I think that's a that's an extension of our multi sector credit strategy. So we, um, you know, most of the stuff we do isn't in liquid forms like that. It's it's mostly in closed end like private equity style type vehicles because they're mostly negotiated like transactions where we either lend to a company or invest in the company. And so there is no liquidity because we're the only person doing the, tr the trend. It's not like there's bonds or, or stocks to trade. Like we're doing a transaction with someone and we're the only counterparty. And so there's zero liquidity in that. But a lot of times um, in those transactions, we'll get a balance sheet to manage. So we might get, you know, we went to a, tra a tra transaction with an insurance company um, and we'll get the reserves, right? So they'll have a bunch of reserves. We'll get that. And so we'll get a $100 million portfolio that has to get deployed into something. Right, and so um, that's where the kind of that strategy comes in because we do mostly deploy it again into the more specialty parts of fixed income because it gives us more 
flexibility, right? We don't, we don't just invest in treasuries and corporates. We invest in ABS and CLOs and, and commercial mortgage backed and all that stuff because they kind of all have different profiles, right? And so they can give you a different, like, you know, depending on what the portfolio needs, you can get a different kind of structure from what you want. And so, um, and so the ETFs are the same thing, right? We think there's a lot of very specialty ETFs out there that are, um, you know, focused on one particular asset class. And our view is like, yeah, there are times when that's great and you want to do that. And there are other times where like that asset class might not be interesting. And so the, one, the ones we did are the same thing. It's multi-sector. It mimics what we do for these insurance accounts. Um, and it's all in the specialty space. And so from our seats, it's kind of like a strategy that gives you, you know, whatever, 100 basis points more yield than you would get if you just did vanilla products. And the, like, the rate duration part of it's a lot lower. So the, in, you know, conceptually, the, the rate risk is not, as, not the same animal as it would be in those other products either. So let's talk about the rate risk. It's interesting. You joined Obra in 2022, which probably timing-wise was perfect. I mean, right? <laughs> Oxid for, I don't know, a decade or so prior in a zero interest rate environment. You know, 2022, rates start moving in a pretty precipitous fashion to the upside. My instincts suggest that was probably really great for your business. Am I right? Yeah, you're right. Because so, um, because of the way we had things invested, we didn't have a bunch of long duration assets, right? If you look at any kind of insurance balance sheet today, they will have a bunch of, you know, there's a bunch of mark to market there from having a bunch of long dated duration assets. We basically didn't have too much of that and we continue not to have too much of that, partly because of our, you know, like what, what we're trying to choose with the portfolios, but partially also because of that strategy that I, that I, suge that I suggested earlier, which is that, you know, we're kind of deploying to create a certain payout profile, right? Not just be really long. And so, um, and so because of that, we didn't have the duration exposure that most people had. And so, yeah. And then now we look at the world and we go, hey, if you can buy, you know, if you look at the interest rate curve, right? There's a little bit of a kink still there. It used to be a lot bigger, right? And if you can invest at that kink, right, then you're getting paid a lot more, just if, even for the short duration asset, just because of the rate curve shape. Forget about what's going on in credit spreads. And so we did a lot of that last year where we bought um, you know, ABS products, which are typically fixed, but they're typically two to three year. And because of that, you were getting a, a really interesting yield versus what you could do in like a five-year you know, treasury or something like that because of the way the curve was shaped. And how are you now looking at the rate environment? You know, where, what's anticipated? How are you positioning the portfolio? Yeah, we've been, look, we've been positioned for kind of higher for longer is basically the way we've been positioning. And so... Um, if, you know, again, if you look at the strategies, um, there is a pretty decent floating allocation to them, and that's because the short rates are so high. And if you don't believe we're going to have this precipitous drop in rates, you'd rather stay in that. And then again, the same thing, we also have a decent allocation to the assets that are relatively short kind of duration, but are fixed, right? Because you get that, you strike it off of that kind of high point of the treasury curve. And so we've been positioning for that now. The question is, is, has it come our way enough that you start thinking about the other way, right? Um, and we're not really, we're not quite there yet, but um, but I think we were very much last year like a seller of like, you know, whatever it was, six great cuts in, in 12 months or something. We were like, we just didn't see how that played out, right? And we didn't see it. And, 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 and you know, the good thing about this, the strategy is that um, you're looking at a bunch of different asset classes. So you're looking at like auto loans and consumer loans and commercial loans, you know, in these underlying pools. And so you can see if there's if things are happening, and aside from you know the the, the kind of the riskiest like the most subprime or the most risky parts of the corporates, um, you didn't see the dramatic like the thing that's going to make you have to cut that much, right? We didn't see that in the in the, in, the, in the performance, and so that's kind of why we position that way is because you couldn't see like the cause, right? That's going to make you all of a sudden have all those rate cuts. Well, it's, so what it, it's it's fascinating that you say that you don't see it until you do, and I'm not yeah. trying to be no, no, yeah, yeah. But when you do, things happen so we really did, quickly. We did. You do see, and like, look in in corporates and like high yield and leveraged loans, the single B or B minus parts. There's a bunch of companies there that are they're negative cash flow because of the rate move, right? And so they need the rates to come down for that to be, you know, for for that to like work out well for them. Same thing in you know in consumer and like the subprime you saw stuff spike up you, you saw it beginning to move, um, it's just that like the in the in the in the core of the market, you didn't you didn't quite see yet. Now it's, it's happening. You see things ha you know one at a time happening, and yeah we're we're mindful of it right. And so we're not like buying <laughs> you know we're we're certainly our portfolios are certainly not positioned to be like aggressive mm -hmm. long credit risk right. We're we're pretty conservatively positioned because it, yeah it's probably coming. And it's just a question of like you know when and to what degree. Right. And so 
were kind of positioned for that, but it was like to see the that kind of a reaction, right? Um, it, it was just you couldn't we couldn't put the pieces together at the time. Right? Yeah. You mentioned consumer. Is that a sector that you're particularly focused on, or which I want sector? To say it's one of the spaces we invest in, um, and it's like again on the on uh, as an indicator, right? We certainly look at, look at it, right? Because you can it's it's a uh, you can very quali- quantitatively cut up very different risk profiles, right, in the consumer space, and so uh, it's a, it's an easy place to like monitor the risk and see what's happening, mm-hmm. right? In a low interest rate environment, and again, I'm not pretending I know your business, I don't, but my sense is you probably miss out on a lot a lot of opportunities because you know people are going way out on the risk curve and they're bidding for things or bidding levels that you wouldn't consider, um, I don't know, interesting to you. But as rates have moved to your favor you probably get now to pick and choose more. Is that, so, a, is that yeah. accurate? Well, it's a, funny thing. it's a funny point because credit spreads aren't wide in general, right? And so, yeah, because rates are higher, you get more yield, but it's not like the credit, all, you know, all credit spreads are suddenly wider because, oh, I can get 5% just by buying treasuries. I need to make 7%, you know, where I used to be able to, I would take 100 instead of 200 um, excess. That, that hasn't happened. Which is again the other reason we're kind of relatively conservatively positioned, is because if you look at it on a spread basis, it's like okay, it's not you know it's not it's not cheap, and that's pretty true broadly, and so um, and so because you don't kind of see that, that's a little bit why we're not being aggressive going down the credit curve. Um, I think we're kind of waiting for that to happen, mm-hmm. right? Because it should, <laughs> right? And right. so, um, but I think there's just been enough demand for for fixed income that. Um, you know, the rate move itself with things, and then you kind of have the demand kind of holding the spreads. Um, and so we're kind of waiting for that for that shoe to drop a little bit, basically. With structured credit, I, you know, you're taking a bottoms up approach, but I'm curious how much or how you approach the macro side of of what you how you look at opportunities with the team. Yeah, I think we over it's an overlay, right? So, yeah. for example, um, when we're talking about, hey, we bought these assets and those assets because of some, you know, some, you know kind of existing condition in in the rates market, um, that's like the the kind of the topper, right? Like so we look at the thing, we say, hey, do we like the risk here? How, you know, what part of the credit curve do we want to be in in this particular asset class? Um, oh, and by the way, if it happens to be, you know, an, an attractive asset to buy because of the kind of overarching environment, you know, whatever, however the world's pricing stuff, um, then that's like a bonus, right? And that's gives you one more reason to like it, right? Um, and I think that's how we kind of overlay it. It's always, yeah, the fundamentals always come first. But um, but I think the thing is you can, and, and again, because these markets aren't huge, right? You can reverse. Like you can say, oh, that's normally a fixed rate asset for that duration. We like that duration, but we would love to have it, you know, floating. Or the other way, we'd like to have it fixed. And and the you know, the banks don't hang up the phone when you do that. You, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. They like they say, okay, well that 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 tranche isn't that big. If you're buying a, bi- a decent chunk of it, we could maybe do that because other people have asked us the same. And so you, like because the deals aren't big and because it's not this gigantic like machine that, that just throws out, you know, that just throws out risk, um, you're actually able to like make those kinds of like tweaks. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's sometimes the value creation, right? And then kind of the other reason for the for the fund launches is, is also the fact that like, you know, it services clients who can't like these asset classes all have pretty decently big minimum denominations, and so you can't really create a portfolio unless you have a certain size. And so, um, and so, by doing it in some readily kind of available form, you can allow people who can't p- construct that diversified portfolio because of the size constraints of the asset classes access to that in a kind of in a reasonable form. Right. Well, well that leads me to this question: so, the value prop of Obra Capital. So clearly, one of them is the fact that you can. Look at look at a structure, and then tweak it to your benefit vis-a-vis what you just said. But you know there are other people in the space. You know how do you stack up against them? You know value prop, what separates you? Yeah, so maybe it's worth talking about like some of the other businesses. Absolutely. Yeah, and so I think you know again we try to we try to be in regionally specialty businesses, and I think um, and a lot of times I think we're trying to bring a level of sophistication to those businesses that the people who generally kind of apply that level of sophistication. The market's not big enough for them to care about it, basically. So for us, we may have a very specialty space that's kind of reasonably sized, and we're going to try to do something kind of, um, you know, sophisticated there. The the competitors who we would normally face, you know, the other people who would do with us, they just kind of might not be paying attention because the market's not big enough for them. It just doesn't move the needle, right? And for us, we're a reasonably small shop. It does move the needle, and it's it's worth 
that work. And so in terms of the product lines, like so for the first one, like the longevity business, that's a super specialized business, right? Um, you're buying, you're buying um, insurance cash flows. You have to go like source them, originate them. The, the underwriting has nothing to do with finance. It's it's all like health underwriting and that kind of stuff. And so we're one of the few people who's actually like vertically integrated in terms of servicing, um, kind of originating and 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 managing those pools. And the other part of that business is that when most almost almost like anyone I know of in that business is directional. They buy the asset because they think it's cheap and they're long the risk because they think it's cheap. Um, and what we're doing is trying to put it together with, you know, if you're going to be the, the receiver of insurance payments, well, we're combined now with an ability to be the payer of insurance payments. And so it's like a long short strategy in insurance that I think is relatively unique. Like we don't have, I don't know of a competitor that's actually actively doing that in, a, in the same fund, right? And we're trying to do it and we're doing that in the same fund intentionally because both things are positive return, right? Right, but their risks are are kind of completely directionally right, opposite. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so if you put them together, you get like a great profile, right? That's kind of what that, that's that's we're trying to do in that business. On the special sit side, again, that this is where we really are. We're doing um, we're we're living in the land between traditional credit products and traditional insurance products, and so we might be lending like a like a credit investor, but um, but the underwrite of the risk is an insurance thing. And so, insurance companies, generally speaking, hate counterparty risk in all its forms. And they, by the way, get punished by the regulator if right. they take it, right? And so, they don't want it. And credit market participants are generally like, you know, like I, traditional, like I want to, I, I want to look at a corporate, understand what the corporate does, understand the, the the financial metrics and all that. And that's not the thing we're buying. We're buying some kind of receivable, right, from 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 a financial institution that has characteristics. And that's like a very, you know, actuarial insurancey underwrite. And so, so we're like this like little bit of a kind of the abyss between, you know, corporates and insurance risk analysis is kind of where we live, right? And we can do it in, we are kind of form agnostic. We can lend, we can invest in the company that does something. We can, um, we can do it as like a contractual relationship. But the idea of that strategy is like, you know, basically providing capital to the insurance and financial services industries in unique ways, right? That other people maybe don't do. Right? So your size allows you to be extraordinarily nimble is my sense. Yeah, I think that like, again, these, again, each one of these little opportunities, it's not, they're not like trillion dollar markets, mm -hmm. right? And so for us, a transaction can move the needle. And again, if you know, we're, we're like single digit billions of dollars, right? So if you add two or three zeros to that. Well, that's gonna be my anymore. next yeah. question. So. <laughs> At what point does, you know, you want to stay relatively yeah, I, nimble, I mean, but then, you know, you get to a point where these deals no longer move the needle. So I'm curious as to like the growth profile. There's yeah, a point I, where you say that's enough. I mean, I, I think we're like safely, you know, one or two zeros away from that. <laughs> so not anywhere, like we're not worried about it on the horizon, right? But yeah, one day if we're like super successful and, 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 and we're, you know, and we're a hundred billion dollar asset manager, then some of these strategies you know, it'll be harder to execute them, right? Of course. Yeah, yeah. And so, but, but for now, we're, there's no like constraint like that. We're, you know, and I think, and I think the other part of it is they all require an investment. Like they're not, um, you don't, you know, some bank doesn't call you and say, hey, I want you to buy this thing that I made. Do you like it or not? Um, oftentimes we're talking to the counterparty and like we together are making the thing. And that takes like, you know, six months yeah. or a year to do. And um, and you have to have that like kind of, you know, and again, because we're, again, our ethos as a firm is kind of this specialty space. And so we view those investments as things we're making, not just for that particular transaction, but for the business too, right? So we're willing to make them because we think, hey, that'll make us better at the next one, or maybe there'll be the next counterparty and do the same thing. And so we're willing to do those transactions where I think other people look at it as a transaction and say, yeah, like that's, you know, that uh, it's it sounds interesting, but Hard to hard to wrap my head around, you know, working on it for six months for whatever size it is, right? Um, and so I guess the, and so that special sys business creates a lot of opportunities where we get again these balance sheets that moves into the multi sector structured credit business where the ETF ETFs were launched. That's more traditional like liquid market stuff. We also do privates there, um, but um, but that's like more typical like hey syndicated things that come from banks. Um, but again, I think there we're saying we're, it's the liquid markets. It's it's the liquid markets world. But we're on the like the esoteric part of that world, right? Um, and then I think on the on the leverage finance side, you know, um, I was very involved in the CELA platform at, at Oxif. Um, Scott Macklin, who we brought in, was from Alliance Bernstein. He ran the CELA platform there. Um, we 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 acquired a, a high yield and research shop that uh, that 
you know, had has been around for about 20, 25 years. So they have a they're a, they have a defensive high yield product that they that has a really long standing track record. And so we're combining that team with with, with Scott on the on the CLO side to, to again, that's more traditional, right? But it's still like on the credit spectrum, the riskier part of the credit spectrum. But we're not doing it in um, as yet in a fund form. We're doing it in a CLO. So it's inside of a structure. And so there's that part of it that makes it a little bit different. So you're issuing as part of that. Yep. partnership you're issuing we're, your own seal yeah we haven't we haven't uh we're we will be issuing yes. <laughs> yeah, we haven't issued yet yeah yeah so that's like and then i think we have this whole asset based side of the business which is where kind of all these other things come in like some we have a commercial origin a commercial mortgage origination platform litigation finance some other specialty spaces where there's somehow something differentiated and, and those are there aren't funds there but um but they get sprinkled throughout our kind of platform in terms of where we put where we, where we deploy that capital Back to the insurance, you, at the beginning of this year, you acquired United Life Insurance. We did, yeah, yeah. Is was your insurance strategy changed after that? Or yeah, so that I think that is it? a that's a reflection of um, you know how I was talking about you know being long short. Well, you can't just commit to like pay insurance claims, right? You have to do that um, through a regulated insurance company, right? And so now we're, we're regulated on the other side of, the of buying the insurance too, but it's a different kind of regulation on the on the, hey, if I want to do a reinsurance transaction and take on you know people's insurance, like you have to be either regulated any of some form to do that. That acquisition had that in mind. So the you know our our funds might ultimately be providing the capital for that, but um, but Unified is a platform on which they can do that. So Unified itself can do insurance as for its own right, but it can also um, take in capital from our funds and, and allow them to to participate in transactions. And I think that's the that's the that's the distinction there. It, now you can do both sides. If you were just, if you didn't have that, you can't actually prosecute the I'm going to pay insurance claim side of the equation. And again, that's like, that was, you know, I don't know if it was a year or, or nine months, but it was a long period of time, right? That we, or, you know, that we invested in that. And getting to closing on that isn't, is not trivial, right? Because like people are, you know, sending their birth certificates to the regulator <laughs> and all that. Um, and so, but now, but that, that's in place. And so again, there we're willing to make the investment to deliver differentiated product, right? And so, you know, we think we think that like the that combining the long short portfolio there like makes a ton of sense. But the infrastructure to do that is um, kind of it's not again it's not trivial to get it in place, right? And you have to be willing to do it. And um, and so I think that's the that acquisition is really uh, the culmination of that of that strategy. Understanding there are different products across a, a wide range of. You know, industries, I guess, how long is it like a typical deal cycle or an investment cycle, I guess is a better word, if there is even such a thing typical? Yeah. So on the, on the um, let's just say on the, uh, on the longevity side for the originating assets, that's not that long. It's probably like, you know, two months to close, to, to you know, trade date, you're done. And then you close, you know, within, within two months on the reinsurance side, it's, you know, they're all typically subject to some form of regulatory review. And so you're talking about six to 12 months, easy, right? And so, yeah, so we were, we were, we were triaging trades before we had it closed, right? We were looking at transactions to close this year before the, the acquisition was actually done because they take so long to actually get through. And on the, on the special sit side, again, some faster than slower, but we have, I have one transaction we're developing with partners for a year. Um, I have another one that was probably was longer than that. And then we have other ones that we 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 um, we enter discussions and and close the transaction kind of inside of a quarter. Because I ask that because within that duration things change yeah. within the duration, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so what made sense in January might look much different on April twenty fourth. On the on the on the on the life reinsurance side, the rate moves alone, right? Right, could change the value. And so, yeah, you have to be totally cognizant of all that stuff and you have to think about it and you can't like paper a trade without mitigating those risks somehow, right? And so that's all part of our process is you have to like, you know, if you if you say you're done, <laughs> then you better be sure you're okay. You're managing the risks you now, you now own, right? And so, yeah, the, and, and, and the rate volatility recently, like both ways, right? Um, has been a material factor on those kind on those kinds so of things. So it's, it's almost like a funky arbitrage if you think of, I mean, it's not a, it's not sort of an arbitrage the way I used to do it back in, but there is a some component of arbitrage in this, if that, if yeah, I may. Yeah, I, I would say we're not like trying to do that. No, no, no. But but um, but yeah, you could you could position yourself 
right, for a risk that you want to take via the transaction, and you can choose to, do, to keep the risk or not keep the risk, right? And so, in some respects, yeah, that's not the mentality for no, sure. No, I know, right? But um, but it, but yeah, you're like when you say you're done, there's a bunch of risks you now own, and you got to deal with them somehow, right? And so, it's a fair point. I mean, these things take a long time. How do you combat mentally? Walk, like, there's times I'm sure where you just have to walk away or let it go, but obviously you're you're mentally invested in what you're doing. So, what lessons can you share? Yeah, I think there? that's like the other parts of the business, right? So, like the the, the loan management and CLOs and the multi sector credit. That stuff is like day to day, right? We're buying you, you, you know, there's a new issue. You look at it, it comes. You do an investment committee. There's you know that that happens inside of a week, right? So there's like this fast and slow going on, um, at least for my seat, right? Where you see both. And so you're not, um, you know, I, I, I kind of tell all of our, guy, all, of our, all of our folks, like, you know, there's, there's, there's trading, right, where you say you trade and, and, and it's done. And then there's doing the, the transaction where there's a 200-page document and you sign it and wire money to somebody. And those are not the same. Those are different things, right? And I think the good, like, what, part of why I like my job is, um, you know, is that we do a little bit of both. And so, yeah, so some days it's, you know, the, oh, man, what's going on? Is that, like, tighter or wider or whatever. Um, and some days you're, you're grinding with lawyers about you know, the terms of this cool transaction you're working on. So for me, I like both, right? It's fun and it makes it interesting. And again, I think it's kind of how we try to differentiate ourselves. How are investors finding you? How, finding us? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, discover not, not enough, fi- like we find you to be great guys and gals. <laughs> you know, discovering for lack of a... Yeah, I think so. We, we uh, on, the, on the fund side, we talk larger institutions. So we have a whole kind of business development uh, team out there doing that. Um, and so, but those are generally either closed end private equity style vehicles or open end hedge fund style vehicles. And then for the for the ETFs, I think all I can say is you can go to overfunds.com. <laughs> <laughs> um, and those are those are the, those are the most available products we have, right? For most liquid, most um, kind of you know transactable products we have. Um, and so that and again, I think we're we're you know we're, I think we envision all parts of that growing, right? Because I think we're trying to we're trying to deliver the underlying, especially skill set in whatever distribution you know, mechanism makes sense, right? And for some of this stuff. There's no other way to do it other than the super closed end, you know, no liquidity vehicle. And for some of it, there's there's more liquid ways to do it. And I think we're trying to be thoughtful about kind of creating the right mix. You mentioned at the beginning that the complexity since you first started doing this obviously has increased. Has that impacted the the competitive edge in terms of the technology that's available to look at documentation, go through deals? Yeah, I think it's a lot. Yeah, I, I, it has. I think it's a lot easier for people to be on kind of a reasonable pl- a playing field, right? To be on a reasonable level of um, just by like hiring the right service providers, right? Um, I think there's a part above that that you, ha- that, that you get through like, you know, having lived through things, right? And um, I think there's lots of people who have those, those skills as well. But I think there's the how you leverage those tools in the best possible way part of it. That's, that's now that I think that's mostly the differentiators, how you like either you know leverage those tools to give to either improve your view or change your view or deliver your view and um and you don't kind of just rely on that that's like the you know you spend your time instead of spending your time like going through a pdf and identifying something you can just look it up in a thing and you spend your time doing other value added things right and so the guy the people who are doing those other value value added things now have the advantage right and the question is how are they doing them and um versus Versus the folks who maybe aren't doing that as much. Right. Now that makes a lot of sense. Well, my sense is the world is setting up for pretty much everything that you've put in place there. I mean, I, again, I've been wrong about many things and I could be wrong here, but you know, reading the tea leaves a little bit, things are moving in such a way where you are keenly and probably positioned extraordinarily well to take advantage of. So congratulations. We hope so. We hope so. Thank you. <laughs> we'll see. But um, I think, yeah, I think we're very thoughtful about, you know, um, we, we like we love volatility in markets, right? We view it as an opportunity, right? And so that you know, rate moves aside, fixed income has been kind of not super volatile, right? And so we're waiting because we think it'll be a good, it'll be a huge opportunity. Thank you, Peter. Appreciate it. Thanks for joining us on the tape. Thanks, Thank you. Peter.